everyone, I'm Rick Benson. You are today is Tuesday, September 22nd, and welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. You're going to see some new graphics this week that uh, Stock Charts has kindly put together. So uh, we get a little new look to things here um, today as we take a look at what the agenda is going to be. We've got our tra trader education portion, and today. Um, I'm going to talk about how to bottom fish um, and try to successfully bottom fish uh, in a market. So you've got to have a plan. You can't just shoot from the hip when you do it. Um, so we're going to talk about bottom fishing with a plan. Uh, we'll do our weekly market overview. And then this week we'll take a look at some of the most widely held retail investor names. Uh, this was from a list that's a little over a month ago. It'll change somewhat. But I was actually surprised at some of the names on the list. So you've got Ford, GE, American Airlines, Delta, Disney, Carnival. Um, I guess what really surprised me was GoPro being on one of, the, uh, one of these lists of most widely held. ECB is, is a Canada stock. And of course, Microsoft and Apple are more what I'd expect to see. So we'll go through those names. And, um, and that'll be today's shows. So... Let's start off with talking about bottom fishing with a plan. All right, so what is bottom fishing? Bottom fishing is trying to pick, uh, getting along a, a security uh, that's been selling off and is continually kind of looking quite bearish. Um, and you're bottom fishing. You're trying to pick an area that uh, may not be the exact low, but you're trying to get in very close to what you estimate the low will be. And in order to do that, um, you need a plan. And, and I say that because you will most likely have no success if you simply um, look at a stock that's been declining and choose for whatever day it is uh, that you do, that that's all it's going to go. Um, and you, you'll probably have some reasons you think so. But um, when I bottom fish, and I'll give you an example of something I just had done for myself in the last 24 hours, um, I do it with a plan. And what's the plan? The plan is that I pretty much know where and when I'm going to come in to bottom fish. So I've got a plan, and the plan could easily have been constructed two weeks before price ever gets there. So I'm usually, uh, when I'm bottom fishing, I have got resting bids in at a particular level that I've done my homework on. And I, I put my orders in before the stock or ETF or whatever it is I'm trading gets there. Because I don't want to start hemming and hawing when it gets to that price. Should I, shouldn't I, what's the news today? Why did it get here? Maybe it's not going to hold this level, etc. I don't want to play that game in my head. I want to kind of have a plan that if in a given amount of time, and of course market timing is an important part of how I look at the market. And any of you who have been listening to me for the almost two years I've been doing this weekly podcast know that um, there's a large element of market timing involved in what I'm doing. So I want to look for levels that I think are likely to hold the support and have them show up um, also at the right time that I think the market could bottom where it does. So um, now how can I plan that a couple weeks in advance? Well, it comes from, again, doing the whole work and then also understanding in not only a price structure, but a timing structure, where are we relative to a potential turn? So let me give you an actual example of something that I've been looking at. We're going to first start with, uh, so here we've got a chart. Here's the XLE, right? This is the Spider Energy ETF. Um, here's, you know, this thing has been a dog. It's sold off in March like everything else. It bounced and now it's coming back down. And, and it kind of, if I eyeball this, it looks, I don't know, maybe halfway down or something like that um, for the rally, you know, kind of like 50%. But 
But in and of itself, other than that, we made a lower height here than we did up here. Um, there's not much structure to this chart by simply looking at this weekly bar chart. So let's now add a few things that I look at. So one thing I'm going to do is add uh, sequential to it. Of course, this is the uh, one of the key timing models that we used that was developed by Tom DeMarc. And uh, you know that, again, for those who have followed me, you know that when you get to a 13 count, um, you're often close to trend exhaustion. Does it always work? No. Here's a case back here in February where there's a 13. The 13, uh, you can see the numbers were coming underneath price action looking for downside exhaustion. Uh, but that's actually not a signal you would have taken because it was in the midst of another setup. So the earliest you would have even done any bottom fishing is perhaps on the nine count. Uh, ultimately, this bottomed on a downside exhaustion signal in March. And when I start, again, kind of putting structure to this, at least from a timing perspective, I see that a couple weeks before the ultimate top was made, this is suggesting upside exhaustion. Um, and you can notice now that we're also potentially on downside exhaustion. So that's one piece that a few weeks ago, I kind of know where we are in the counts. I know what needs to occur in order to get potential downside exhaustion signal. But again, in and of itself, that's not enough for me to necessarily put on a trade. So let's now add what are called TDST lines. And TDST lines are lines that get formed from any time you do a setup, which is the nine count to the downside or the upside. This setup nine count, which ended here in March, the highest true high of that count was actually the close beneath, uh, I'm sorry, above bar one. Normally it would be bar one's high, um, but because there was a gap, it's actually, you take the close. And what I had noticed on this rally that stopped going up in June is I had from a timing perspective, a sense of exhaustion close at hand, and I had a TDST line, which is um, where essentially this piece of this downtrend started from. And I noticed that the high of the move came a couple weeks after the 13 and right against the TDST line and not a place most people would pick as the top of a move. There's no real strong resistance at this level. In fact, you would have seen here there was a large price gap in March and you would have thought, you know, somewhere closer to the high end of the gap or the close from that bar would be resistance. Well, I kept pushing further, but I noticed the TDST line is where this move stopped. And as we sold off, by June, I was already thinking to myself, hmm, if this ever sells off down to the most recent TDST line, which is this line here, formed after the 13 was created in March, and then we did a nine count up. That nine count allowed us to count to the 13. Where did that trend start? Well, it started here, according to this, at 31.39. So this line comes out and says potential support here. And as we get to support, which we hit last week, what do we see? We're on bar 12, and this week is bar 13. So now I'm thinking, all right, I could buy the XLE, or I could buy some names in the XLE that I think are important names. And so that's how I start constructing ideas of where and when to put things on. And you can see, obviously, I'm bottom fishing. This has been declining since June. And of course, the whole thing's been, you know, anything in the energy space, if I bring in a lot more data here, you're going to see how just simply horrific, you know, energy has been as an investment. So it's not been worth going into for quite some time for years, in fact. Um, but when I start looking at it now, I think to myself, is there a high odd or are odds high, let's put it that way, that the March lows are going to be taken out? And in general sense, I don't think so. You know, for the S&P, I don't think the market's going to come back to the March lows. I've made that very clear since March, or actually better said April, that the lows were in for the year and that we would not retest them. 
So I'm thinking about that ter in terms also here of the energy market. And of course, it's been an underperformer, the worst name, uh, the worst of the 11 macro sectors. But I'm thinking to myself, is energy also going to get back down to March or slow? And I'm thinking to myself, probably not, because that was such a vigorous and huge down move at the time that things were, that rubber band was so overstretched that I'm thinking this is probably not a bad place to start thinking about maybe going into some energy names. So there's one that I've been thinking about for a while, and I'll show you. It is, uh, here we go. So here's Chevron, which is a name I've kind of eyed for a while and think to myself, you know, kind of a, one, of, one of the best names in the energy space as far as um, their ability to uh, move from fossil fuel to more clean, efficient fuels. And, you know, who are the companies that have the resources to, to really be able to pull through the shift that's going on over time? from fossil to clean. And uh, it's not gonna be a quick thing, and it's, this is not something I expect to have you know, instant bounce. This is not a, 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 a trade I'm expecting to put on for two weeks only. So I look at this kind of long-term chart, and I see that the March decline even extended beyond the 2008 low. But it was you know all within a week, and then everything shot back up. And that, um, when I, I then do this trend line from the 2010 low to 2015 low, I see, okay, somewhere in the low 70s, we're getting closer to what that line was. So if this was an overstretch, you know, somewhere down in the mid to low 70s is potentially support. And then, let's blow this up. And um, I put, I'm trying to remember here, I put on my TDS to lines, if I remember correctly, there we go. And similar to XLE, this has now, I've known for months that 7511 is a level that should hold. And if my assumption is correct that we're not gonna go back and test the lows, then between that other longer term trend line and this kind of 75-ish level here, Somewhere around here is where this name should hold. And so I knew for weeks already that 7511 was my level. So we got there yesterday. Um, I had resting bids in that I put in a couple weeks ago, knowing that level was key. And then when I switched this to a daily chart, and we put up, let's say, aggressive sequential. I have, by chance, yesterday, there's a downside exhaustion signal. So this is how I kind of line up what I call bottom fishing. Going after a name that's been beaten up, that's out of favor, that a lot of institutions and individuals are kind of given up on. And I knew from the weekly chart, 7511 was the TDSD line, the, the, the key support level. And the only really major support level that I'd say was above uh, those March lows. I see on a daily chart a sense of potential downside exhaustion here just happened to come in at the same time. And that's why I feel much more confident that I can take a stab here at bottom fishing in this name, in this sector. Is, is it, uh, do I have high, high confidence that it's going to work? The answer is I don't know. Uh, anytime you bottom fish, you know that you're going totally counter trend and you know, against the grain and you're kind of saying, all right, I'm picking a point that I think something's not really going to fall much anymore. And that's what I'm doing here. And, uh, I probably risk a few bucks on the trade and I have to see how things line up. But if I'm right, then over time, I could see, and this is just a daily chart, why couldn't this thing go back to 90? Right, so from 75 to 90, it's 15 bucks. 15 bucks on a $75 stock is 20% upside. 
Uh, and we saw that level just in August. So I'm not like reaching for something crazy here. It's, it's a level that was just traded a month ago. Um, but if I'm right and we are close to a bottom, most people aren't going to realize we're close to a bottom. This just looks like pure downtrend and you know something else. If, if I put this in the scheme of what's going on this year, you know, you're not going to find a lot of people who are likely coming into this area who don't understand these models and would look for this to be a place to turn around. So I'm not telling you to buy this in your own portfolio. I'm not doing that at all. I'm telling you this is something I did for myself in the last 24 hours, and it's a trade I've been waiting for. I've had good till cancel orders on this for quite some time, just knowing that if we got down to that level, making the assumption I have that I don't think the March lows get taken out, even in this crappiest of all uh, macro sectors, the energy sector, um, then this is a logical place to come in and kind of fight trend and say, I don't know, I'll take a stance here. And that's, so that to me is bottom fishing with a plan as compared to just coming in one day, looking at a chart and saying, oh, this looks okay, let's buy it. This is something I've planned for several weeks to do. And uh, the only time will tell now if this is right. Okay, let's do our quick market um, overview for the week. So we will go back here and let's move forward. Oh, well, let's of course, uh, to sign up to get my weekly ETF technical trader report, it's called the TTR, technical trader report, it comes out every Wednesday night. Um, and it'll pick, uh, it'll give you a, a very good market overview, much more in depth than what I do here on the show. Um, of course, it's for subscribers, so they get much more detail and strategy, uh, plus a new ETF trading idea each week. Um, or if you are interested in more longer term investing and the, um, and the attempt of actually of beating the S&P, then I've just recently started a new monthly piece called the 7-Eleven Report, and it will pick no more than seven of the 11 macro ETF sectors to be in at any one time with the goal of avoiding the underperformers and thus beating the S&P over time. Um, you can get all that information and how to sign up at inthenotrader.com. For those of you who want to reach out to me by email, it's rick at inthenotrader.com. And okay, so now let's take a look at our weekly comparison of uh, S&P performance week over week. There's only four sectors of the 11 that moved more than 1% this week. Um, none of them actually hugely. And even though, again, these, if they have a dot next to them, um, they've moved 1%, red dots, they've underperformed by more than 1% uh, the S&P week over week. The green dot is energy. Um, so it was down almost 49% versus the S&P last week. Now it's only down 47%. So it, it, it actually moved a couple percent, but you can see it is still clearly, you know, when you talk about bottom fishing, you know, this is, this is a sector that is um, just decimated versus the market. It's the second year in a row too that energy has just been horrific relative to the market. And if you think about you know, what we're accomplishing or attempting to accomplish in the 7-Eleven monthly report, avoiding energy, you know, if you just avoid the energy space and the financial space, um, you know, this year, you've outperformed the S&P. I mean, it's just mathematically, that's the way things work. So uh, our goal is to stay away from the underperformers. And of course, at any time, these underperformers can gain against the S&P like, uh, like energy did this past week. So it's not like we necessarily stay away from energy all the time, but this is a kind of longer term type uh, investing newsletter. So it's not for quick traders. Uh, it's for people who want to do better than the market. So we use lots of metrics and quant models and stuff to come up with our uh, picks each month. Okay, let's now take a look. We'll go back to our charts. Let's um, pick, uh, here, let's start with the Dow Jones. So here's a weekly chart of the Dow Jones, like the S&P. Uh, it topped on a setup nine count. So off of that bottom in March, all this price action 
was choppy enough that you never got a nine count, but when you finally were able to nine consecutive Fridays, close above the close from four Fridays prior, you put that pattern in and, and that was the top of the move. Um, so the key level here for the Dow is 26,360. As long as we stay above that, um, then this is nothing more than a correction and a consolidation of this huge move. Obviously the S&P and NASDAQ made new all time highs, the Dow did not. Uh, you know, a couple big names of the Dow that have dragged on the Dow, Boeing being one of them, um, and therefore the Dow has not made all-time highs. But if you uh, follow the Dow, uh, we don't often, but uh, many of you do. So 26,360 is the level that I'm looking at there. Um, if we take a look at the 10-year, here, this is the TNX, so this is in yield terms, and I've drawn several trend lines that most people are going to draw off of the highs um, from March, and this one broke, the, the purple dash one broke, and then uh, the orange one broke to the upside, and now we've got this dark blue one that's kind of just trying to hang in there as long as, as, long as this pink line off of the June high. And what we've said, you know, a lot of people are gonna get faked out by uh, yield or essentially selling the bond market thinking yields are going higher. And this is one of the reasons why, again, I, I incorporate to mark models into what I use. I've consistently said that the TNX needs to get above 7.45, which is the TDSD line going across here that we've got highlighted. Until you properly break through that, um, you have no breakout year. And this is all just, again, part of this basing action that's been going on. Um, there have been four TDST lines on the daily chart this year. None of them have been broken, uh, gotten above. You can see even here in June on the high, uh, the high came into the TDST line, the highest high of the most recent nine count down, and it's the same thing that's happening now. If we get above 74 and a half basis points, which is the same as TNX 7.45, uh, then we can look for about 93, 94 basis points as our next target up. Otherwise, um, you know, bond rates just sit here and, and there's nothing to do. And let's take a look at, uh, let's see, the gold market. So um, we've been down here before. So one of these, uh, the week after the all-time high was made, we got down as low as 1974. Uh, this week's low is currently 1985. And I, same thing as long as we kind of hold it here, gold's still just consolidating. You, you clearly you ran sell stops when you took out like a month's worth of lows, but you know we haven't taken out this low yet, so I still look at this as a consolidation. Um, longer term, I like gold. I, I've been telling clients I don't want to get you know add exposure above 1900, only beneath 1900 if I'm going to. Um, so at least you're there now and haven't paid above 1900. Remember the all the prior all-time high was 1924, I think it was, where this line is, yep, um, for front month active future, so we are beneath that. So um, that's a simple look. Of course, we can add cloud chart, and it looks like we finally have broken beneath the conversion line, so look for support here around 1833. That'll move up a little bit more next week, I believe. Um, and of course, you know, you've got to do your analysis. Long-term, I think gold still has its, its you know, chances to go higher. Shorter term, I'm not so convinced, which is why I'd rather have market sell often come to me rather than me chase after it. All right, that's it for a um, for the market overview. Let's get to some stocks while we still have about five minutes to go. So let's um, we'll go back to Chevron and let's just switch this. All right, here's Ford. Ford made a this is uh, it's a daily. Let's move this to a weekly. Okay, so here's the weekly chart, and let's put up standard sequential too. Boom. All right, so um, we've now kind of triple topped into this area here near seven and a half over um, last week's high about five weeks ago, and then maybe, I don't know, 12, 15 weeks ago in here. So uh, there's clearly strong resistance against these old lows. Uh, we can draw a trend line here. Um, Let's just see. Okay, so we're still above the trend line 
Uh, in order to get a downside exhaustion 13, you've got to get down towards six bucks. So still, I'm, I'm not ready to buy this name here. Um, don't love the name anyway, but um, um, I'm, I'm not yet a willing buyer. You've got to break out above here uh, to next target, the 933 level. GE, the name many have uh, written off as goners. Um, and clearly, when you take a look at where this thing has gone, what's happened over the last few years, you can easily write it off. It's still consolidating all the way since March. Uh, nothing special here to look at. And um, I don't even know if, let's see, a month. Uh, interesting, look at the monthly chart. So we have at least consolidated since that 13. So March on a monthly chart, happened to put in a 13. Um, kind of somewhat double bottomish between, I guess, five and seven and a half. You've got a couple more weeks to go where you do a nine count. This may be interesting in a couple weeks if you want to potentially do a little bottom fishing, but I still wait for now. Um, American Airlines. Um, let's go back to a weekly chart. So nothing special here. Obviously, the airlines, any of these names that are in the travel space um, are going to look somewhat similar. Here's Delta. Let's see. Better name than American. You at least see some move off of uh, the summer lows or the late spring lows. I'll go back here. Look at American Airlines. Um, Well, trend line holding, and you're right about on the trend line now. Delta, maybe it's just the scaling. Maybe, yeah. Um, actually, still above the trend line. So it's it's a slightly better game. Still multiple tops, you know, whether it's here, 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 uh, 35 ish is, is you know, where this has not been able to get through. Next week, potentially uh, a downside 13, depending upon where it trades. Um, and how low it gets. Um, I, I, I guess I'd say the same thing right now. I still have no strong reason to go into the name. Disney, um, nine count pullback, nine count pullback. Uh, let's put propulsion on and see. So as long as Disney stays above that one, uh, there's that one 1865, it's still okay. Um, but this is caught in. There's a lot of price action that's been in here uh, the bulk of the year. You have no real particular big uh, where the price is right now. Um, yeah, it's still part of an uptrend, but uh, you've also got a downtrend, and there's a lot of price action. This, this is probably better range trading. Maybe if you put like a Bollinger Band or something on here, maybe as you get down to the lower band, you know, a better place to do some buying versus in here right now. I don't really see much there. Uh, Carnival, we're not going to be able to get to all these names. Again, uh, you know, anything in this travel leisure space, I'm, I'm not too keen on yet. Uh, so let's look at Microsoft, see what we've got there. So big pullback, but still holding uh, the, well, in and around the $200 level and, and the lows from um, the lows from, let's say, in here. Uh, so I'd say as long as this is still above 195 ish, it's okay. Beneath 195 uh, has a chance to get down to about 175 or so. That's going to be it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Rick Benson, you are, and this has been In the No Trainer. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.